Well, we're moving our way through um, Matthew's gospel. And today, I think, to me, we're going to once again just see how important God's word is in our lives. You know, I, I've used this statistic, <clears throat> but four, if you do not read your Bible more than four times a week, and we should read it every day, all right, every day. But statistically, I'm, I'm using statistics here, it makes no difference if you don't read it four times or more. It just doesn't, there's not enough repetition for it to really lock in. And I think today when we kind of go through this scripture, uh, you may see why it is so important that we kind of have God's word inside of us. And uh, so today's topic is temptation. How many like the topic of temptation? Not a single one. Yeah, you're like the guy, I heard this guy pray this, all right? He said, Lord, deliver me from temptation, but don't remove it completely. It's a joke. All right, it's a joke. So the thing here with today's scripture is that Jesus passed the temptation test using no extra powers than we have. Sometimes we think, well, Jesus could do it because he could walk on water. But using no extra powers, no, he was 100% human. Uh, the testing was strong. Everything he did in this period of time, this testing, was something that we can do. And that's, that's the power of this particular scripture. You know, some temptations are worse than others. Is that right? That's right. How did you know? Jerry, Jerry knows me too well. See, ice cream's not that bad, all right? Murder is. <laughs> <coughs> Temptation. We'll see that temptations that Jesus went through are some pretty tough ones. So here's, here's what it says in James. You are tempted. This is really interesting. You are tempted by, you know what you're tempted by? The evil things you want. Your own desires lead you away and traps you. Your desire grows inside of you until it results in sin. It's like this thing inside of us. It's our own evil wants. So, um, what happens if we don't resist temptation? Well, all we have to do is go back to Adam and Eve to find the answer to that question. Everything changed, and uh, one choice affected everything, and it's still affecting our lives. And we've seen, I, I will guess, that every one of us has seen somebody that has not been able to ref refute some temptation that has gotten them into big trouble. We all know somebody. And so it is a big deal, uh, understanding what temptation is and how it works. Uh, so let's look at this strategy. I want to jump right into the scripture here. But we're in James chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Here it is. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Would anybody else be hungry after fasting 40 days and 40 nights? I, I can tell you for sure I would fall into that category. But here's the thing. He was led by who? The Spirit. Have you caught that when you've read this before? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by who? Satan, the tempter. The devil. <clears throat> now, a lot of times when we're tempted, you know, Satan, there was a third of the angels that fell. We call them demons. Uh, they move around doing stuff and tempting. But Jesus was tempted by the devil uh, himself. And uh, who knows just how to do that. But this was a necessary part of Jesus' ministry. He was led by the Spirit. So it was important. It needed to happen. Why? Because Jesus identified with us in every way. Remember last week or last chapter, or last part we went through, we talked about Jesus' baptism. Remember that? Talked about his baptism. And John said, no, 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 I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no, it, it must be this way. Why? Because Jesus needed to go through what we went through. He needed to be tempted like we are tempted. Why? So we can't say, you don't understand. You don't get what I'm going through. Yes, he does. He understands. In temptation, 
I can't resist this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay, well, good. We've got that settled. That's great. So it was a severe temptation. Listen to this contrast, all right, from the cool, cool waters of the Jordan to the barren wilderness. Listen what happened, right, one thing right to the other thing. From the huge crowds to a solitude and silence out in the desert. From the spirit resting like a dove, and now the spirit drives him into the wilderness. From the voice of God saying, my beloved son, to the devil hissing in his ear. From being the anointed to now being attacked. Um, from the heavens opening to Satan coming up and speaking to him. Je Jesus did not need to be tempted to help him to grow. He didn't need it for that. He didn't have to have that. But it was for us. Listen to what it says in Hebrews. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our, weak with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet, what is it? Without sin. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for going through this for me. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't tempt us, by the way. Uh, he can maybe lead us to a place, but he is not the tempter. Who is the tempter? Satan is the tempter. Satan is the accuser. Understand that. Him and his fallen angels, the demons. Uh, and temptation hits everybody. Uh, and Jesus' temptation, I would say, was severe. Somebody, one of the commentators I, I read, and I don't know if there's any way of proving this stuff, but his idea was Jesus wasn't just led in the desert and then after 40 days tempted, that the whole thing was a temptation, and this was the culmination of it. I don't know, but I, I would say that certainly could be uh, possible. Spurgeon said this, Luther's remark stands true, that prayer, meditation, listen to this now, prayer and meditation and temptation are the three best instructors of the gospel minister. Isn't that interesting? I, I don't think I would have come up with that all on my own. Point. Remember who the enemy is. How many times do we point at somebody else or something else? Um, our enemy isn't politics. Our enemy is Satan. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but divinely powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. Remember who we're fighting and fight that battle first. Having said that, make sure you vote. Satan attacks when you're at your weakest. Did you know that? Usually isn't attacking you when you're in a praise service and everybody's praising and raising their hands and you've joined in and you're singing praise and worship. That's usually not when it happens. It's after 40 days in the desert when you're tired and you're hungry. Maybe when nothing is going right. Tired, lonely, feeling unappreciated, overworked. That's when Satan often hits. And they, Satan's attacks can be harder and stronger uh, than you think. The number 40 is mentioned here. You know, there was a great flood, 40 days and nights. Moses spent 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert, 40 days on Mount Sinai. There's a whole list of this number being such an important number, uh, but it is an important number. But uh, temptation, temptation. So let's get into them. He learned obedience through the things which he suffered in other Hebrew scripture. Here's temptation number one. Lust of the flesh. When the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Here's the thing. Uh, when the tempter came, when, not if. Doesn't say if the tempter comes through this, the tempter will come. 
Understand that. He will come. It's not, a, it's not a matter of if. It's always a matter of when. How will we go through this? Wow, let's look at what Jesus, you know, kind of his frame of mind here. Uh, before the temptation, he was in a, a especially devout frame of mind. As I said, he was being baptized by John, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. Uh, he was engaged in the public act of obedience to his Father's will before the temptation hit. He was humble at that time. Uh, it, that was demonstrated. Uh, his sonship was uh, uh, announced to everybody. It was clear. Uh, he's filled with the Holy Spirit before his temptation and separated from the world. And that's when the tempter comes. Comes after that, when everything's going well, and then when, when you're tired after all of that and you're hungry, and that's a moment of weakness, that's when he comes. Satan's arguments always will seem logical. They'll always seem, I don't have time to elaborate on this, but when he comes, it always seems like it's feasible what he is saying. What did he say? If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Let me ask a question. Was Jesus the son of God? Yes. Could he command the stones to become bread? He could. He could. So it was logic. It could seem logical. It could seem logical. Uh, and so don't be surprised. You'll, you'll, say, you'll get something whispering in your ear. Well, why can't you do this? Everything should be. And you'll know something's wrong. You might not be able to articulate it yet, but it will sound logical. And if you're not, if you're too quick on the trigger, you're in it before you know you're in it. You understand what I'm saying? You, you've, you've, you've pulled the trigger. You've, you've given into it. And now you're in it. And that's just, it happens quick like that. Uh, Satan's requests will always seem advantageous and doable. Um, Carson said the sonship of the living God, he suggested, surely means Jesus had the power and the right to satisfy his own needs. And some people have said this, Jesus was being tested not on his weakness, but on his strength. You are the son of God, therefore you can do this. You have talent, therefore you can do this. You have power, therefore you can do this. You're an important person, then you should be able to do this. You're the boss, whatever. He appeals to that. It's doable. It seems doable. But here's the thing. Jesus knew God's word. He didn't just know it, but he understood it. Do you understand that Satan knows the word of God too? He, sh he certainly does. So uh, Jesus doesn't silently disagree with him. He answers from the word of God, from Deuteronomy, and he, he responds to what Satan has said. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So it is important to understand, have some understanding of what God's word says, and to use it correctly. I've said this many times, but I'll risk saying again. You can take a scripture, pull it out of context, twist it, and it can become a heresy. You can take it out of, out of what its original intent was, make a quote, and it can become a heresy. It's exactly what Satan did. He pulled it out of context. When you have a check in your spirit on this, you know, you'll, you'll hear somebody say something, you'll say, I'm not sure that's right. Put a pause on. Hit the pause button. Hit the pause button. Ask somebody that you trust what the answer is or what you should do. I will, I will venture to say most of the time you know what the answer is. But Satan has a way of appealing in that temptation way that it's uh, easy to give, give in to it. Let's go on to temptation number two. The pride of life. The pride of life. So the first one is the lust of the flesh and then the pride of life. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the uh, pinnacle of the temple. He said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you. 
In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said again, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. How important is it to know the word of God? Pretty important. But I don't know all the word of God. Well, let me tell you this. My experience. God will give you what you need when you need it, as long as you're doing your part on it. You know, he'll give you the verse you need, maybe the night before. But you got to be, you got to be pursuing it yourself somewhere along the line, the line here, and you'll get what you need. So don't say, well, I can't possibly memorize the entire Bible. Neither can I. But if we're pursuing it, I believe God gives us what we need when we need it. And that's an important uh, thing. So what does he say? Cast yourself down. He took him up to the pinnacle, the pinnacle. So this pinnacle of the temple rose some 200 feet from the floor of the Kidron Valley. So it would have been on that side of Jerusalem going down to the Kidron Valley, which went up to the Mount of Olives. So that's where they are. But it was 200 foot. So he's saying, uh, just jump off here. He'll give his angels charge over you. You'll be fine. Don't worry. You won't get a scratch. Everything's good. Jump. It's a long ways. You know, it's a long ways from this side down to the bottom over here. Those, those of you that were here when this when the church was built, I've heard stories of people on the roof, and you know they put those they put those uh, uh, two by fours or whatever they use to catch people in case they slip. I guess one guy was kind of up at the piece, and we heard they heard a whoa, and he's he hit the board, went boing, kind of bounced back up, and and that's not you know nowhere nowhere near. Uh, 200 feet. So Satan knows how to use your pride. If you're the son of God, then you can do this. That's kind of an appeal to your pride. And he also knows how to use God's word. So I asked you that question uh, before, but he says right here, he shall give his angels charge over you. So he knows God's word too. So it's important that we know it and understand it in context. And if there's something we don't understand, ask somebody investigated there's so many resources just available uh even online right now satan quotes psalm 91 so uh he he incorrectly quoted the verse he left out a part of it and that's his way of doing things um you shall not tempt the lord your god jesus replies with scripture but uses it correctly Final temptation, lust of the eyes. What was it that guy said? Deliver me from temptation, but don't remove it completely. Well, yeah, remove it completely. <laughs> Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you all you have to do is fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord, your God, and him only shall you serve. Satan can offer you things. He's the prince of the power of the air. So he has some control and he can offer things. But they come at a price. They always come at a price. They always come with a catch. You've seen things that come with a catch, right? You've clicked on something, and, and now they got all your information, and then there's some trick to it. And you say, no, I don't want that, but they've already got all your information. Or, you know, there's, a, there's always a trick in there somewhere. Often there is. If you will only fall down and worship me. Isn't that what Satan has wanted from the very beginning? Isn't that what he wanted? He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted people, and he still wants that. To, that hasn't changed. He still wants. He still wants worship, acceptance. Everything he's doing is fine, and it's not. In Isaiah, it's uh, Isaiah. It says, "I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne." Above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. 
on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights, and I will be like the Most High. That's Satan speaking. I want to be like God. He offers the kingdoms of the world uh, without showing the sin side of it. He only shows the pretty side of it. We've all seen that in, in various ways in our own society. And what, is, what does Jesus say? Away with you, Satan, for it is written, and then the devil left him. Amen. Resist the devil, and he will, come on, flee from you. Yes, we resist. The devil leaves him. Satan is, and then he left him, and then behold, the angels came, and they ministered to him. Deception is Satan's biggest tool. Get us deceived, not, not, not seeing clearly. We have to see temptation for what it is. It's a lie. We have to combat it with the word of God, which we need to, uh, we need to read and understand uh, and build ourselves up in, in his truth, have it in our hearts. I want to just, uh, and, and, and by the way, help was on the way. The angels came and ministered to Jesus. You know, when, when you feel like you're going through something like that, remember that uh, it doesn't last forever. I had somebody once tell me, was in the middle of a, everything was going on, lots of uh, production, it was a production. You know, a lot of things weren't going quite right. And I might have been a little frazzled. I know it's hard for you that know me to believe that. And... Uh, she said to me, oh, I'm passed away. Just remember, next week at this time, it'll all be over. <laughs> it's like, okay. I, you know, look a little farther down the road. Don't just look right here, okay? Don't just look right here. Let me list just a few temptations that are considered some of the top ones. Number one, money. The lie is that your fulfillment in life is tied to how much you have. Truth. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money isn't the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, lie number two has to do with sex, or temptation number two has to do with sex. I can look at and flirt with it as long as I don't indulge. What does the Bible say? That's exactly right. I heard it here, and I think I heard it over here too. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Temptation number three. Pride, the lie. Don't admit your struggle because people will look down on you. You need to seem like you have it all together. Here's another lie that kind of goes along with that too. Look how wonderful you are and all that you have done. People should be praising you. The truth, pride goes before, yes, destruction, the fall. And a haughty spirit right in there, too. Truth. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Temptation number four. Envy. The lie. I'm a better person than that person. The only reason they got this is because fill in the blank. Truth. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Envy. We had a friend, Jody and I did, a Presbyterian minister. And uh, I remember walking down the street and a Mercedes Benz went by and he went, lust, lust, covet, covet, lust, lust, covet, covet. It's amazing what you remember, isn't it? I remembered something from um, a book written by C.S. Lewis. And I'm going to get to that here in just a second. But right now, I just want us to receive communion. And then I want to I read some of the things that C.S. Lewis wrote while we're preparing. So if you would get your communion... Uh, service that's there in front of you somewhere.
uh-oh, these are different. Well, I guess you're supposed to take the bread out first. Okay. I got it. If you do the cup first, don't turn, open it. Don't turn it upside down before you take the bread out, okay? Too late. Let's stand together. So, in um, C.S. Lewis's book was called The Screwtape Letters. All right, and here's the premise. The premise is one demon, like a head demon, is speaking to a new recruit. And when you hear the word the enemy, that is a demon talking about God or Jesus, okay? So, so you kind of get that context. Here are some of the things that were written in this book of a, an older, experienced, higher-level demon to another demon. All extremes except extreme devotion to the enemy. Who's the enemy in this case? It's God from this point of view. All extremes except extreme devotion to the enemy are to be encouraged. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. That's the name of the underling. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but intending to do our enemy's will, looks around upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and yet still obeys. Never forget that when you, we are dealing with pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure, but at the same time, it's his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is encourage the humans to take the pleasures from which our enemy has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden. A moderated religion is as good for us as no religion at all. And it's more amusing. Tortured fear and stupid confidence are both desirable states of mind. Surely you know that if a man can't be cured of church going, the next best thing is to send him all over the neighborhood looking for a church that suits him while he becomes a taster or connoisseur of churches. The search for a suitable church makes the man a critic where the enemy wants him to be a pupil. Wow. Let's meditate on those for a minute. Tremendous insights. On the other hand, we do want and very want very much to make men treat Christianity as a means, preferably, of course, as a means to their own advancement. But failing that as a means means to do anything, even to social justice. The thing to do is get a man at first to value so social justice as a thing which the enemy demands and then work on him to the stage where he values Christianity because it may produce social justice, for the enemy will not be used as a convenience. Think about that statement. This was written in 1941. This is not a modern day thing. 1941. I have one more, but I'll read it here at the end. So Jesus said when he was conducting uh, the Passover meal or what we call the Last Supper, um, he said, do this in remembrance of me. 
And I just wonder, how often do we think about uh, the temptations that, that Jesus went through? The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes. How often do we think about how he combated and won over temptation? And just to remind ourselves that we can be effective in that area as well. We do not have to give in to temptation. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Let's eat together. As we take the cup, let's be reminded of all that Jesus defeated. Not just temptation, but sin, all sin, for our sakes, simply because he loved us. In a like manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood shed for you. Take, drink all of it. Thank you, Lord. Let's give him praise for just a few minutes here. Let's give him praise for what he did. Remember what Jesus did. Lord, the word tells us that when you were tempted, you suffered. We know that you suffered many abuses, especially that last week of your life. And you did it all for us. Just because you love us, and that's so hard to understand why. And you said, do this in remembrance of me. So we remember the broken body and the, and the shed blood so that we remember it. We don't take it for granted, Lord, but we're appreciative. Thank you. And thank you, Lord, that you made a way for us, that we do not have to give in to temptation, but we can resist it. Thank you for your great example. Thank you, Lord. Can we say amen? Amen. There was one more thing that uh, I picked out of the, the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis, again, which was written in 1941 or 42. Again, one senior demon talking to another one. Make full use of the fact that up to a certain point, fatigue makes women talk more and men talk less. Much secret resentment even between lovers can be raised from this. <laughs> Lord, bless us as we go. Lord, thank you for helping us to be on to Satan's schemes. Help us to live a victorious life. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Good day. God bless.